All right, let's start off with the anti-Ukrainian movements that are popping up abroad and popping up at home. So first thing I want to talk about is what's going on in Poland. Poland has a very big election coming up. October 15th, the Polish elections are coming, and this is a big moment where a lot of opposition parties have coalesced into form one coalition called the Civic Coalition that is trying really hard to oust the current prime minister who was under the Law and Justice Party. The Law and Justice Party has won the 2015 elections, and they've won the 2019 elections. Now, the Law and Justice Party... Um, has been responsible for a total ban on abortion, intense anti-immigrant stances, and was against the EU. Um, it generally, they're a very Eurosceptic party. Mm -hmm. They've also pushed judicial reforms that have arguably violated EU law. Um, the courts in Poland are more stacked than what they are in the United States. The equivalent of the Supreme Court in Poland is currently made up by 10 appointed people, all of which have been appointed by the Law and Justice Party. <laughs> so how does that wow. sound? Yeah, exactly. So the yeah. EU is not happy about that. Yeah, this is a this is clearly a democracy that's backsliding into something that's not a democracy. Exactly. So now the Civic Coalition is being led by a man named Donald Tusk. He was the prime minister uh, who started in 2017. Uh, I'm sorry, from 2007 to 2014. And he has been fairly active in the EU since. So this is a very, you know, common story of pro-EU, liberal party, anti-EU, illiberal party. Now, in addition to this, there are harder right-wing parties and then harder left-wing parties also in these elections. We have the hard right party, uh, the Confederation Liberty and Independence Party, the center party, which is a third-way political alliance party, and then the hard left is the new left party. Now, what I think is very important to understand like what this election means in Poland is the future of Ukraine, right? And that's what I want to talk, like all of these elections that we're going to talk about and the at-home politics here in America, how does this affect what's going on in Ukraine? How is this going to affect the fighting? Well, Poland has been the largest acceptor of Ukraine refugees. They have been one of the, if not the largest, um, arms funders in Europe. As percentage of GDP, Poland gives a ton of money as percent of their GDP. Um, if I'm reading this chart right, it looks like Poland gives has given about almost 0.8%, 0.7% of their GDP to Ukraine with the war effort so far. So they have been a very big ally. They have also helped gotten jets to Ukraine. Um, but that all looks like it's changing. The current government um, is now pulling back off their commitments. And the current prime minister has suggested that Poland was done sending weapons to Ukraine because Poland needs to focus on its own defenses. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Poland has been boosting up their military funding over the last couple of years since the Ukrainian invasion. And now they're reluctant to give any of that stuff away. And what this means for Ukraine is Ukraine needs to become independent because Poland is no longer going to be a good and helpful ally mm -hmm. um, if the elections go this certain way, right? October 15th, things could change. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's not good that there is this animosity that's growing between Ukraine and Poland. Yeah. Well, of course, it's a much easier sell to say we need to keep our military capacity at home within our country in our hands because you can even kind of frame it like look at what just happened to ukraine we need to make sure that we're ready if someone comes knocking on our door exactly and the eu is even doing the eu is helping ukraine not just through military means but also through economic reforms of the european union mm -hmm. this is against the interests of poland animosity is growing because the european union is trying to allow ukrainian grain into the european market which Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia are massive grain suppliers to the European Union. And with this Ukrainian grain now going into Europe, it undercuts the small business classes of these countries, which is a massive voting block of the current majorities. Totally, totally. So that is a huge issue for the working class people of these countries who 
view this as a materialist perspective, as we're doing too much for Ukraine now, it's hurting my pocketbook too much, and you want to send all of our guns over there, it's too much for me, I'm out. Yeah, and it's tough because Ukraine needs to get its grain out, and it can't get it out via the Black Sea anymore, because Russia is taking control of those ports. So it's looking around, it's like, we need to ship our grain out, even though they can do it at much lower capacity because you can move grain way less via rail than you can via the water. Mm -hmm. They need to get as much out as they can. So they have some economic production coming into the country. But if you're surrounded by other countries, which of course makes sense geographically, right? Like if there's if there's fertile ground for growing grain in Ukraine, then there's going to be that same type of, of soil and environment in these surrounding countries. Um, but there's no real easy way to say, we don't even need you to take the grain Poland. It's fine if this grain gets further west into Germany or Spain or France or Great Britain. Um, but as soon as it comes into Poland, it's still hitting the Polish market and it's still endangering the profits of those local growers. Yeah, exactly. And so if the, even if, but what's scary is even if the opposition wins, even if they get into power, we already talked about the Supreme Court. And so it's not called the Supreme Court in Poland. It's called the Constitutional Tribunal. And it has 15 members, not 10. But like I said, all 15 of those members were appointed by the Law and Justice Party. It's crazy. So that's a huge roadblock to any type of legislation, right? Well, on top of that, the president of Poland is currently a member of this Law and Justice Party. So they have a president and a, and a prime minister, and the president can veto any legislation passed by this, and they need 60% to overturn that. So it's not even like any new legislation will be very possible at all. No. So the only thing they can really do is staff the current government bureaucracies with, you know, more liberal people, and then hope that they're able to make better decisions with regards to Ukraine and Europe. But they can't really pass any new meaningful legislation, yeah. which is... It's almost like this election is like a midterm in the United States. Yeah. You know? Totally. Uh, yeah. It's it's hard. It's like the best best case scenario is like the a new president or prime minister. I, I don't know which it is. Yeah, no. You, you, the best case scenario is to get a new president, but that's like for another two years. Oh, oh okay, okay. Yes. The so they can, they can basically only block further pushes to the right yes rather than actually push anything to the left that's basically what this is going to be okay yeah um and on top of this in uh on top of just the general legislative elections they also the law and justice party also put four ballot measures on the on the ballot as well mm. the four ballot measures are this do you support the sale of state enterprises to private companies um i didn't get the chance to look up who side is who was on what side of that but mm. I assume law and justice is a no on that, pretty hardcore. Do you support raising the retirement age? Do you support um, bringing in more immigrants? <laughs> What's so funny is how they worded the question oh on the ballot. Oh my God, it's crazy. You ready for this? This is how, the, how it's worded on the Polish ballot. Do you support the reception of thousands of illegal immigrants from the Middle East and Africa in accordance with the forced relocation mechanism imposed by the European bureaucracy? <laughs> Could the negative undertones be any more obvious? The answer is no. That is just so <laughs> brutally dishonest. That's it's like, insane. That's literally what the professor in stats puts up as the example of like what not to put on your survey. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, it's just so funny. And then the fourth question, which I can't believe is getting asked, do you support removing the border with Belarus? I don't even know what that means. I don't understand that because tensions... Last time I looked at Poland and Belarus, like a few, a couple of months ago, tensions were rising at the border. Yeah. Like Belarus was doing a bunch of military training exercises right on the border. And we've talked before about in Ukraine, like Russia's impetus for invading Ukraine being that they want to push their influence far enough that they plug the geographical gaps that other countries might take to come into their country and invade. Belarus obviously is just an extension of Russia. We've talked about how one or two, I don't remember, of those gaps are in Poland. Mm -hmm. So it makes all the sense in the world that po that Belarus might invade Russia. So I was, I was, I thought it was ridiculous when I read this question. I know. Like, it's absolutely absurd. I think this goes back to there was a lot of refugees that got their way into Belarus and then got into Poland through the Belarus-Polish border. Okay. So I think that they are going to try to really militarize the border with Belarus. Okay, so... so in, re in response to this ballot. Because I think 
Okay, so you're hoping that when they say, do you support removing the border with Belarus, everyone's going to answer like, hell no, of course not. That's what the answer is going to be. So we need to close it that much tighter. Yes, that's what that's what I think is going to be going on. That makes sense. I mean, that (laughs) that's such a ridiculous, like ask any member of any country, do you support removing the border with Canada? Well, I'm not really afraid of Canada. I like Canada, but no, I I don't want to to remove remove the border. border. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. What a stupid question. Okay. okay. So that's Poland. So now Ukraine is losing Poland. Okay. Ukraine is losing access to the Polish military assistance. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now Slovakia. Um, might be one of the only times we talk about Slovakia on the show, maybe. But here we go. Slovakia. Slovakia is also seeing a rightward shift as well. But it looks like extremely different from any other rightward trend that I've seen in any of the other European countries. It's very interesting. Um, when the election results were coming out, The exit polls indicated that the progressive party, the PS party, was going to win. And I was all shocked. I was like, oh, nice. All right. Good job. These progressive party, very pro-EU, very liberal, um, uh, not really socialist at all. Actually, fairly liberal on economic stuff, not socialist, um, and very pro-Ukraine. So I was like, all right, nice. Six hours later, all the exit polls were wrong. And turns out that the Social Democrats won re-election. Okay. Social Democrats won re-election. That sounds great. I don't know a lot about Slovakian politics. Sounds good to me. Um, Well, uh, psych, dude. Uh, The Social Democratic Party of Slovakia have taken an intense rightward shift in recent years. And the party now focuses more on social conservatism, nationalism, Euroscepticism, and anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. This is such a departure from the majority of Social Democratic Party's in Europe and like the progressive wing of the Democratic Party here in America, it's shocking to me. Yes, it is very different. I mean, we've talked about and we've known that there are kind of two different spectra here on the the social and political and economic uh, belief systems, right? There's economic liberalism versus economic conservatism, where economic liberalism tends to desire more government intervention and control of markets or like more rulemaking to make sure they don't get completely out of whack versus conservatism is just like, let them run free. And then there's social liberalism, which is, and I think like thinking about libertarians is a good thing Mm -hmm. on this. Libertarians are totally economically conservative or free market, but they also are usually extremely socially liberal. Like, yeah, totally. Um, Gay marriage, I'm down with that. Trans rights, I'm down with that, right? Like no discrimination, I'm down with that. Um, so this is weird because you rarely see an economically liberal and socially conservative party. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's not a, it's not a frequent coalition. No. Um, so now, while this party is continuing the creation and expansion of a normal left-wing welfare state, as you would expect, um, they are now shifting on the EU completely, as you've stated, and also very much on Ukraine. But now let's talk about the progressive party that I alluded to earlier. The leading opposition, the new, more recently formed progressive party, this party only came up four or five years ago. So the fact they're already polling in second place at a national election is very impressive. Mm. Um, They're fairly neoliberal in its economics, right? Mm -hmm. And we we did a deep dive on neoliberalism. I highly recommend you watch it because it doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, But it's, and it's more globalist in nature and very pro-EU. It's much better on social issues, um, and was leading in the exit polls, like I said, but somehow they ended up losing. This is the first time that the Progressive Party has actually made it into the national parliament. They've gone from zero seats to 32 in their first election. Wow. So you can see a clamor for this more socially liberal aspect in represented in government, but it goes even further than that. Because recently, um, this year, there has been a split amongst the social democrats. Hmm. Um, this year, there has been a new social democratic form, Democratic Party formed in opposition to the more entrenched social democratic party called Halas. And this Halas party split with the original social democrats due to the fact that they are not socially progressive mm. and they're not pro-EU. And Halas is that social democratic alternative saying, we want a large welfare state, yeah, but we're not willing to throw LGBTQ people and Ukraine and Europe aside to achieve it. Yeah. We're not willing to do that. Um, and so I think Halas and pro- and the Progressive Party will be a strong opposition to this rightward shift moving forward. But 
that means that the Social Democrats are going to have to find new friends to make a governing coalition with. And who are those friends going to be? So unfortunately, one of them that I think they will most definitely join with is the Slovak National Party. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not going to hide it. These are the bad guys all around. Okay, they were a part of a go of a governing coalition, formed a governing coalition with the Social Democrats back in 2006, and these guys are hardcore libertarian, anti-state, Eurosceptic, but were formed by neo Nazis in the 80s. So that libertarian mm. thing that means economically libertarian. Mm. That does not mean socially liberal, like Ben just said. Mm. That is like a very strict sell off all private uh, all public entities to the market interesting because that's yeah. not how i would really describe like nazism or fascism mm -hmm. either because fascism usually is like let's integrate all of the companies with the state to expand state control to expand authoritarian control of a single leader well i'll tell you the nazi party actually had a massive increase in privatizations during their reign the nazi party sold off a ton of their assets with the condition that they would be party loyalty in yes. the corporate boards. Yes. Right? Okay. So I don't know the Slovak National Party's idea of libertarianism. Sure. I imagine that's what they're talking about. Okay. okay. You know what I mean? So even if it's not technical right. government control, it's government control effectively. Yeah, I, you know, I would like to say it's party owned. Yeah. Okay. Right? Not state owned, but party owned. And there's a massive difference to that. Mm. That I mean, that just reminds me of, it sounds like... With Poland, I feel like we didn't we didn't super talk about we talked about the um, capture of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk that much about the capture of the media. Oh, I didn't even which talk is about the media. part of the campaign of uh, of the Law and Justice Party. Yeah, so, what's going on with the media in Poland? They're they're trying. Part of their platform is to essentially make the public uh, news channels, the public media channels, to be single party channels um, to be completely partisan uh that is where i think it relates to what mm -hmm. we're talking about yes yes and yeah. we've seen in america what happens when we have news stations that go down the party line route yeah. and it's an absolute nightmare it's a nightmare but i must say we're almost luckier in this case because it's not like the ruling party mm. in government kind of controls all of the information that's going out true so even though it's bad to have two very partisan media sources that's still way way better than one really partisan media partisan media source very true and what if they're able to actually capture you know the media and be able to push their party's narrative it's everywhere over. up and down it's over it's over it's done we the always talk about everything. yeah the media has all the power yeah um and so now Slovakia has gone down this road. We have the, we have Slovakia has gone down this road. We have Poland going down this road. Now what's happening to America? Unfortunately, it looks like America is going down the same road as well. I've been champing at the bit to bring up how every time, every example you're talking about, I'm like, oh, well, it sounds like what's happening here. Exactly. But I exactly. wanted to wait till. So yeah, here we go. We have the U.S. government funding fight that's been going on. Whew. So luckily... The United States Congress has passed a continuing resolution for 45 days um, that will appropriate all the money from the year 2023 up until year 2020 in 45 days. We'll get there. We'll yeah, talk we'll, more about that later. We'll, we'll go much further in depth on all that. But the point is that it passed 335 to 91. And this is a short term funding bill um, with it passed with 209 Democrats, 126 Republicans and 91 um, Republicans voting no. One Democrat voted no. The Democrat voted no because there was no Ukraine funding in this continuing resolution. The 90 Republicans voted no because it gave too many kids access to education. So the one, yeah, okay. Um, the Senate uh, led by Mitch McConnell, or the Senate Republicans led by Mitch McConnell, trying to push for a bill that would have Ukraine funding in it. And at the end of the Senate conference, the Republicans said no. They said, do not send that bill to the House. It will fail. It will not go through. It will not work. McCarthy cannot get his ducks in a row to get Ukraine funding. Now, this is insanity to me because McC McConnell used to be the ringleader, the whip. You know, he used to be he used to be every part of the governing apparatus of the Republican caucus. And now here he is. He's the dog getting wagged by the tail. Totally. 
totally. This this tale is solid. I mean, I don't want to go too much into it because we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it means for Ukraine is they're, they have to lose a little bit of trust in the funding and the support they get from us. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're not, not, they're not going to be reliant. They cannot be. I'll say this. They cannot be reliant on the United States. So with McConnell not being able to whip the Republican caucus into accepting Ukraine funding, it shows that not just the Republican Party is failing to support Ukraine, the general American populace is souring on it too. And so the U.S. population is shifting. And this is something Ukraine is going to have to take into account. Overall, this is from a CBS News poll last Sunday, 55% say the United States Congress should not authorize any additional funding to support Ukraine versus 45% that say Congress should authorize new funding. 51% say that the United States has already done enough, and 48% says it should do more. It makes, again, all the sense in the world. I just talked about this with Poland. It's it's just so much easier to sell <laughs> We have our own problems, and we need to keep the money here to solve those problems. And it's a much more complex, even if true and important argument, to say, part it is in our interests to fund the war effort that is happening over there. That the, the destabilization that would occur by us allowing a country to just trod over the border of another country... Um, kind of unprovoked is so detrimental to our own economic interests, to our own security interests. And our ideological interests. Yeah. We are we are believers of democracy, of liberalism, and we cannot let one fall to this illiberal democracy that is expanding from Russia inward. And we were talking about off screen that this illiberal democracy is being flourished even at home in Central and Eastern Europe as well. Yes. Under Viktor Orban in Hungary, he has really ignited this new political ideology that I like to call illiberal democracy, where yes, people still vote, but your natural enlightenment values are being stripped away from you. Your fundamental human rights are being stripped away. Yes. And that's what's going on in Hungary. That's what looks like it's going on in Poland and all the rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, do you want to say anything more on that? Or do you want to swift to the Ukraine funding specifically? Let's go on to Ukraine funding. It might come back up, but let's move on for now. Okay. So I want to talk about who funds Ukraine the most. So European Union institutions fund Ukraine the most when it comes to financial assistance um, and humanitarian assistance. Uh, Financial assistance, uh, the European Union has sent over $80 billion over to Ukraine. Now, financial assistance is very a hot topic, and we're going to have to get to that because I have issues with our financial assistance to Ukraine. I think it's being misused. And I think we're we're going to need to talk about that. Hmm. But the United States, the United States has given so far around $47 billion with military aid, and then an additional $30 billion of financial assistance. Drops down very quick to Germany having like $20 billion, United Kingdom having $15, down, 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 and down. But this doesn't give a really good picture of who's giving the most to Ukraine on what they are able to give. So let's do this chart again by percent of GDP that's being given to Ukraine. Norway is giving 1.6% of its GDP to Ukraine. Lithuania, 1.25%. Estonia, over 1.25%. Latvia, Denmark, Poland. Poland is giving 0.75% of its entire GDP to Ukraine at the moment. Right under Poland, Slovakia. 0.65% of its GDP. This is massive amounts of money for these countries. And you can see it's the Eastern Bloc. It's the countries who are on the front line against Russia who have been funding the war the most as compared to everyone else. Which makes a lot of intuitive sense. Of course. Like, let's make sure that they can do the best they can. So hopefully we don't have to join this fight. Exactly. And the United States is down near 0.3%. Yeah. Right. So that also puts us to line of perspective. We say like, oh, the United States is contributing the most military. Yeah, it's also because we have the largest economy in the world, right? That, yeah. So it makes sense that we're contributing the most. We can. Because we have the most to contribute. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Per capita, 
uh, and per percentage of GDP, it's the Eastern Bloc really holding up this defense. And if the unity in the Eastern Bloc crumbles with the nationalist movements in Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, we're going to have a lot of problems with European solidarity going forward. Yes, yes. My worry with that would be like, who can Russia win over? Right. right? Especially if Russia's standing at your doorstep being like, you can join us and not get invaded, or we can walk in and start <coughs> shooting you and your women and children. Right. And Hungary, I don't think is very far away. No. You know? No. Um, I mean, hu- Hungary with Orban, like they don't, they don't have, they don't really have loyalty to ideals, right? They're just, especially Orban himself, he's just loyal to his own stay in power. So if Russia is able to offer that, no, I mean, truly, the, the Hungarian ideology at the moment is nationalism. End of story. Exactly. Right? There's nothing else. So let, let's break into a little further into the United States, the United States funding specifically. So we have $46.6 billion of total military aid, $23.5 billion for weapons and equipment, um, $18 billion for security assistance, $5 billion for loans for weapons, and then we have this $26 billion for financial assistance. We have $4 billion also for humanitarian, um, but that's not the most important part here. This financial, 34% of the money we give is for budgetary aid through the Economic Support Fund loans and other financial support. This is where the American people feel like we're getting screwed. And there is something to say about that, because even Biden is admitting behind closed doors that where this financial aid goes is a problem. So a leaked sensitive memo from the United States intelligence agencies contends that if corruption is not rooted out in Ukraine, Western support will slip and it will slip fast and sees this as the number one threat to Ukraine's survival. Wow. They are already seeing the writing on the wall that the United States public is now thinking that Ukraine is too corrupt to accept this money, put it in the right places. They don't like seeing the headlines that this financial aid is going to to shore up pension funds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a problem with pension funds getting shored up because I think that, you know, is important for their national security and economy. But if you can't give us a direct breakdown of what our financial assistance is doing for Mm -hmm. you, why the hell should we give you any financial money? We should only be giving you guns and bullets at that point. If you're not going to tell us where the money is going and why you're putting it into these places, I'm not giving you anything, right? Yeah. So the Biden administration is in this really difficult position because it doesn't want to push too hard on Ukraine because if it publicly pushes too hard on Ukraine to get their stuff in order, Republicans can jump on that and then expose that in the national media and then corral public opinion to say, look, even Joe Biden is admitting that Ukraine is too corrupt to give us any money. Stop giving money to Ukraine. Mm. So he can't even have this public debate because of how optically terrible it'll look for the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. So now Biden is working behind the scenes to do what he can to make this right. He has said that future economic aid may be conditioned on reforms to tackle corruption, to make Ukraine more attractive for private investment. Um, This is not being considered for military aid. So for military aid, the funding is guaranteed. For the financial assistance, Biden is saying, you get your shit in order, otherwise we're taking your money away from you and we're not gonna help you financially anymore. In response to this, Zelensky has fired numerous top defense officials and is really following a lot of U.S. and EU advice because it knows it needs the support more than anything. Yeah. I mean, honestly, this is the right way, in my opinion, for the U.S. and the EU (coughs) to wield their power, Mm. right? You need to make sure that the country is being run the right way. On, I think, our last episode, you were talking about how it kind of leaves, maybe it was two episodes, a sour taste in your mouth that the U.S., is considering um, helping out Saudi Arabia with a defense pact, Mm -hmm. right? And trying to stoke better relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel because both of those countries rest on extremely illiberal laurels. Um, To The right way to do it is to use your influence to push them (coughs) in a more liberal direction into a better way of governance. And so that's what Biden's trying to do here. Yeah. And one of the things I really like is that the United States is helping the Ukrainian government building out an accounting chamber so that the U.S. can track where the money goes exactly. Mm. So a specific accounting agency of where all this money is going, Mm -hmm. that would be massively helpful to ease public opinion, ease my mind of someone who's massively pro-funding Ukraine. 
listen, if I'm having doubts of giving financial assistance to Ukraine, we have a problem. Yeah. Right? Totally. And so I want this accounting thing to be done. There are also some things that the Biden administration is demanding that I don't like. Okay. And I think it's a very neoliberal. Okay. Not liberal, capital L, neoliberal, Mm -hmm. very free market, very pro-capitalist. And I think it's a little bit of an issue. So um, the Biden administration really wants to reduce the state's role in the banking sector specifically this bank called Alpha Bank, and return Alpha Bank to private ownership. So I looked a little bit into this because, on principle, I'm not against nationalizing banks during wartime. That's not something I'm initially against. I don't have a problem with the government making sure that financial incentives are lined up correctly through the banking apparatus. Um, But Alpha Bank used to be a Russian-owned bank. Mm -hmm. When the war started, Ukraine nationalized this Russian-owned bank. Again, I'm not intrinsically against this. After the 2009 recession, the United Kingdom government bought a lot of common voting shares of banks and elected members to the board of directors of these banks specifically to change the banking policies to make them more conducive with the government's policy of getting the country out of recession. It increased lending and lowered compensation, doing a bit to help the economy, right? Interesting. So I'm not against this in times of of danger. Um... And with the track record of the United States reaping um, colonial benefits Mm. out of other countries during their times of stress, (coughs) I don't really like the idea of the United States going in and dictating economic policy to Ukraine. I don't really like that. Okay. Did you read anything about why? Like, what is the administration saying as a reason? How are they justifying this? So it does make good sense. It... What bank would want to open up if Ukraine if it thinks it could be nationalized? Yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's the general argument against nationalization. It's the general argument, right? Why would Chase Bank ever want to expand over into Ukraine if during a weird time Ukraine can just say, "No, you know what? I'm taking over your bank." Yeah, but Why I would also Ukraine want to do that. That is a good reason, but is it a good reason to explain why it is in the U.S.'s interest? Is it, I mean, circuitously, you could look at it as if you have these this finance industry that is doing more for your economy, that would mean that it's less burdensome for us to support your economy. That's where I think they're coming from. But that's like a, I don't know, that's that's a reach. I think it's a reach too. But I, I also think there is something ideological about this. Okay. I do think the United States is ideologically against the nationalization of banks, period. Okay. And I do think they don't like that a country they're propping up has nationalized a massive corporation. Sure. I don't think they like that. Yeah, I do. I get that. But I also think, I don't know, maybe this is the neoliberal in me, mm-hmm. that the a privatized alpha bank might be able to reap in more profits during wartime that could then be used in the country's GDP to keep it afloat a little bit more than a nationalized bank would. Maybe it's I mean, a it little depends. bit more willing to take risks. Um, I mean, generally, we don't like... <coughs> financialization too much Mm -hmm. Um, but this seems like a time where if you can play the numbers game with money a little bit better it could be really helpful Mm. truly if if the state is able to utilize those resources effectively right if the state is able to tax the 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 profits made by the bank well and you know be able to utilize the increase in gdp to the state's capacity yes because if not it's the same problem as the corruption right it's just the money is being siphoned up into a group that needs it less than the rest of the country. Right. So that's the issues and the pros about privatization. Um, I think it's all about trying to get more private capital into Ukraine. Okay. And the, no, it's just really hard to convince international companies to go into a country that can nationalize businesses. True. There's no reason for them to do it. Yeah. And it's one of the issues I have with um, a more aggressive state oriented socialism because i think that that problem is ubiquitous of all social movements that will ever happen mm-hmm. all social revolutions will actually come into that problem where turns out we actually need the people who have the capital to be here it does make me think that yeah. the united states is in a very interesting and beautiful position to have social revolution because it has all the capital already here yeah right totally whereas these other imperial adjacent nations like Ukraine 
they're very reliant on international capital to keep their lights on. Exactly. Our market is, is too important for these companies to leave. Exactly. Um, awesome tangent. But so this is where we're at, guys. Poland says that they're going to pull all military funding. I don't really buy it, but that's what they're running with on the election. Mm. Slovakia, heavy anti-EU, heavy anti-Ukraine stances. The Republican Party of the United States, firmly against giving any more money to, the U- to Ukraine, and the United States population is anti-Ukraine. Now, anti-Ukraine by like 10 points. Yes. Which sucks. Dude. A little bit more anti-Ukraine. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It just breaks my heart because it, it used to be such a bipartisan oorah democracy yeah it is i I mean the policeman of the world rhetoric is always hard to sell and we we honestly have kind of gotten lucky because we're in such an obvious good guy bad guy situation right now true right that's the only reason we had such support for this in the first place Mm -hmm. um but i think if this was saudi arabia getting invaded by iran would I be so gung ho about giving weapons to the defending nation? I don't really think so. No, of course not. Of course, and I don't think you should be. Right, right. It. I think it's good to be ideologically driven on these things. Yeah. Um. But of course, like the media takes some time. You've got your Fox News and specific because this is really like I think the Times put out an article today about how this is the benchmark test. This is the litmus test of the Republican Party right now. Mm. It's like whether you're for Ukraine aid or against <laughs> Ukraine aid. It kind of. De- it kind of defines whether you're a MAGA Republican or a more quote unquote moderate Republican. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have these more conservative networks like Fox News, like OAN, like anything else that's even further to the right of that, that are planting these ideas more and more and who are already spouting this rhetoric of like our country is in shambles right we are we are destroyed we're in terrible shape right now how can we justify sending money overseas when we have all of these problems of our own and it's it's crazy to me because it's literally only 0.3 percent of our gdp yeah i see people on twitter and like raging against sending money to ukraine to like oh my god can you believe how much money we're giving and then someone in the comments is like how much money do you think we've given and they're like 10 percent of gdp at least it's like how cognitively dissonant how unattached from reality must you be to think we've given 10 percent of our gdp to ukraine when it's actually 0.3 percent this is the problem with just honestly just having a big population you've you've talked to me about how people don't understand per capita in the oh, comments they don't um <laughs> you guys got to do better you guys don't understand what per capita means and it drives me insane well I, the issue is like just any person that reads 50 billion like wow that's a lot of money and wow, I would be an idiot to think that that's not a lot of money. Of course, fifty billion is a lot of money. Yeah, but it just happens to actually not be. It's just actually not a lot of money. No. I don't know what to tell you guys. Yeah, there's it's, just that much money. But again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there isn't a problem with where the money is going with the financial assistance. I want to see better regulations with regards sure. to that. But I'm not going to stop sending them bullets because of it. No, no, that's not even on the table for me. No. 